If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 2. We are going to the book of Acts, or the first couple of chapters in uh, the book of Acts. for that. Technology and I don't always jive together. We try. But sometimes it just it just doesn't happen. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 uh, verses 14 uh, to 24. <clears throat> but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. <clears throat> and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning, and we do ask for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see Jesus, to open our ears to hear his word, to open our hearts to receive that word in, in, in us. And Lord, I pray that the word that is planted within us this morning will grow and bear fruit in us, that it will not be an idle word, but Lord, that it will be powerful and effective in our lives. Lord, give me the strength that I need to preach this message. I acknowledge my weakness to you and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, on Friday, Grace and I and our children attended a wedding, um, and it was again a wonderful time to be uh, reminded of, of marriage, of, of a wedding ceremony. And as the, as the groom came up and as the bride came up and everything was, was beautiful and everything was wonderful as weddings oftentimes are, um, the speaker, the pastor, uh, reminded me again that the wedding is only a day, 
but marriage is for a lifetime. And for those of you who have been married for any length of time, you recognize that the wedding is only one day, but the marriage is going to be for the rest of your life as long as you both shall live, as you've made those vows. And as I was reflecting on this, Pentecost was a single day, it was an event, there is light, there is sound, there is, there is a commotion as it were, and yet what was promised on that day, what Pentecost means, carried on through the centuries, from Pentecost to the Perusia, that is, the coming of the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit has been given. <clears throat> Last week we noted that when the Spirit-filled life speaks, people will gather to listen and respond. We learned that an international crowd assembled there to hear all the different languages spoken. And when they heard their own language, they responded with surprise and confusion. They didn't know what was going on. And some of them said, what is the meaning of this? And others said, <clears throat> they're drunk, they're filled with new wine. And the same is true for us as well. Whenever we see, uh, whenever, whenever people see our lives and note that we are different, they also will respond out of curiosity or mockery. There is going to be this, what is going on with this person? Why doesn't this person complain? Why doesn't this person um, do what I do? Why is he or she different? They might ask you, they might not, but we do have an obligation to speak up and explain our lives to them. We must speak, and Peter calls his audience to listen as he explains to them the events of Pentecost, namely why these Galilean men are speaking in foreign languages and languages that they understand about the greatness of God. And Peter calls his audience to listen as he explains Pentecost by the prophet Joel. How is this prophecy of Joel fulfilled at Pentecost? Well, God pours out his spirit upon all people. God gives wonders and signs before the great day of the Lord. God saves all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Listen up. Pentecost means that God pours out his Holy Spirit. It means that he performs signs and wonders and that he provides salvation for us. Let's first explore the summons to listen up. Peter summoned the people to, of Jerusalem to listen up. We read in verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Peter spoke up and beckoned the audience to listen up. He did not merely show his life, he told it as well, he told what was going on. <clears throat> Why? Oh, listen up means that Peter will defend Pentecost from mockery. In verse 15 he says, For these men are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Earlier in the passage, as I mentioned, people, certain people thought that these men were drunk. And Peter was like, no, hey, that's not what, what is going on. Let me tell you, they are not just babbling like the town drunk, carrying on about nonsense. Listen up, do you hear what they are saying? Do you hear what they are speaking? They are talking about the greatness of God, the mighty works of God in Jesus Christ. Listen up means that Peter will explain Pentecost to them. No, these men are not drunk, as he said in verse 15, but this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. Listen up. He says, basically, something wonderful is going on here and I'm going to explain it to you. Prophecy is being fulfilled at this very moment in history. <clears throat> Listen up, we ourselves must give ear to the word of God. Our culture trains our ears to tune out God and his word. We are bombarded and saturated with a myriad of voices from every conceivable media avenue, radio, television, the internet, video games, news flashes on our phones, text messages, and so on, Facebook notices. Our culture delights to feast our eyes, dull our ears, and starve our hearts. Yet God's word beckons us to listen to him. In both testaments, the old and the new, God constantly says, pay attention, hear, hear what I have to say. Again and again through Deuteronomy, Moses beckons the people to listen or pay attention. 
Solomon, the wisest king, oftentimes said, listen to the wisdom that I'm giving to you. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear or pay attention to what you hear. And now Peter joins in this chorus of people and he says, listen up, pay attention to what I have to say. <clears throat> listen up. How many of us find it very hard to pay attention these days? To listen. It is hard to pay attention to God's word when so many other voices buy for our attention. It is difficult to listen to an entire sermon that I'm going to preach, and hopefully, the Lord willing, God will speak to your hearts this morning through it. And graduates, as you travel on to your prospective places, this is God's word. Listen to him. Stay close to him. That's the best advice that I could ever give you, is to read and be saturated with God's word. You will, you will inevitably encounter various temptations there. How are you going to fortify yourself to say no to them and yes to what God has in store for you? I don't know, but read God's word and may his spirit speak to your heart. <clears throat> God's word will be the wisdom in the midst of foolishness around you, the lamp to your feet and the light to your path when the way is dark. Feast upon his word and ignore the dry husks of this world. <clears throat> Why do we need to listen? Why do we need to pay attention to God's word? The ear is the avenue the gospel travels to germinate faith. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Listen up. What you hear might actually save you. <clears throat> Listen up. Why? Let's move on to the next point. God pours out his Holy Spirit. After Peter tells his audience to listen up, he then quotes a lengthy passage from the minor prophet Joel. The beginning of Joel's prophecy tells us that God will pour out his Spirit. We read in verses 17 to 18, And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Why do we need to pay attention to you, Peter? Listen up, he says, Pentecost means that God is pouring out his spirit upon us in the last days. The very first line says, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit. So when God has poured out his Holy Spirit on Pentecost, that signified the last days. The last days began some 2,000 years ago. We oftentimes get caught up in, well, when is the end going to come? Well, I don't know, but the last days are here. And all the other New Testament apostles and prophets have said the same thing. <clears throat> they understood that the coming of the, our Lord Jesus Christ and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the last days began. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, but understand this, in the last days there will be time come times of difficulty. Well, we look around and we see times of difficulty. The author of Hebrews tells us, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The Apostle Peter says that Christ was made manifest in these last times for your sake. And the Apostle John is bold and he says the, it is the last hour. We are in the last times, and the Holy Spirit's being poured out upon us um, signifies that it is the last days. Are we ready for that? Listen up. God pours out His Spirit on us generously. Even though we are living in the last days, God has not abandoned us. He has not forsaken us. He has poured out His Holy Spirit upon us. <clears throat> God says, I will pour out my spirit. The phrase pour out refers to rain. I say this because in Joel 2.25, right before these verses that Peter quotes, Joel says, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Thus, when God is said to pour out His Holy Spirit, it is like a downpour of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> As one commentator said, it is not a drizzle, it is not a sprinkle, it's not even 
it, it's not even a steady rain. It is a downpour of the Holy Spirit. God gives us His Holy Spirit abundantly. He is not stingy. He is not skimpy with it. He pours out His Holy Spirit. He is generous with His Holy Spirit. Elsewhere, the, the Apostle Paul declares that God poured out His Holy Spirit on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. God is rich beyond all measure, and He delights to give His people the Holy Spirit. And have you ever considered what the gift of the Holy Spirit is? Or who the gift of the Holy Spirit is? Have you considered Him? God declares, I will pour out my Spirit. God didn't give us a, a subpar Spirit. He gave us His Holy Spirit. Consider Him for a moment. He is, as His namesake, holy. And so when we have the Holy Spirit, He seeks to conform us. He makes us holy. And then He, he, he moves us to live a holy life before people. <clears throat> When God, the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. This means that when God pours out His Holy Spirit, God is able to make a, a dead man come alive, so to speak. We are dead in our transgressions and our sins, but when God's Spirit comes, we are, we are born again, we are made new, we are new creations in Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, is all-knowing. He knows the deep things of God. And He who searches those deep things of God, He knows us. He knows the movings of our heart. He knows when we are depressed or we are sad. And He will comfort us and counsel us. He is our advocate. He knows when we are joy and He, he joins in with that joy, as it were. The Holy Spirit is all-present. David said in Psalm 139, 7, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I free, flee from your presence? There is nowhere that you or I can go away from the Holy Spirit. If you are in Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you, lives in you. And so, if you are to go with the astronauts up into the space with the twinkling stars, the Holy Spirit's going to be. If you go to the depths of the ocean, into the Mariana Trench, some two miles below sea level, the Holy Spirit will be there with you. As the graduates go off to college, and they have the Holy Spirit with them, He is going to be there with you, to counsel you, to comfort you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He is with you in your dark, depressing days. He is with you in the topsy-turvy culture that we live in. God has poured out His Holy Spirit upon us. And consider, too, that through the Holy Spirit, we experience God's love. Romans 5.5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This God has poured out His Holy Spirit, His eternal, His infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful Spirit, and He has put His Spirit in us. Furthermore, God pours out His Spirit on all people. Consider the scope of people God pours out His Spirit on. He says He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And then He lists your sons and your daughters, your young men and your old men, and my male servants and female servants. From this list, we understand that God is, is not... Uh, he pours out His Spirit on men and women, the young, the old. He does not care whether a person is rich or poor. All people can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He does not care if they are the master or the servant. He pours out His Spirit on all these people. And clearly, the ones who receive the Spirit are those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yet, and there is no separation or division that God's Holy Spirit will not overcome. Like a tsunami, he overcomes a wall, so this Holy Spirit overcomes all divisions within us. It doesn't matter male or female. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter what language you speak. God's Spirit comes on all those who call upon His name. Note, too, that the Divine Spirit poured out on all flesh is a spirit of prophecy. 
Again, when we examine these verses in Scripture, we will see twice that God said they shall prophesy. They shall see visions, dream dreams. Now, in the Old Testament, the prophets uh, had dreams and they had visions and so spoke. <clears throat> Thus, as Martin Luther said, prophesying visions and dreams are all one thing. Yet, what does it mean for us? In context, it surely referred to the proclamation of God's mighty works in other languages. This is what God said would happen. At the inauguration of the last days, God poured out the Holy Spirit, and so we expect to see the apostles prophesying. So what do we make of it? Do we still prophesy? Do we still have dreams and visions? And you might think, well, I had a pretty strange one last night. But I don't think that was God speaking to me. And what is going on? I think two things will help us. One, we need to have a correct understanding of what prophecy is all about. Typically, we tend to think that prophecy is foretelling the future. Yet, foretelling the future is only part of the prophecy. The greater part of prophesy, prophecy is speaking God's word or expounding a form of revelation. Thus, the prophets in the Old Testament always expounded upon the law of Moses. If we take it to mean speaking God's word, then wherever God's word is spoken truthfully, then prophecy takes place. For instance, when a discouraged brother or sister comes to you for help, for advice, for comfort, encouragement, and you speak, you quote a verse, or you speak a word of encouragement to them, you are in a small way prophesying. It's not you're saying, you are not saying, thus says the Lord, but you are acting as God's voice to that person who needs to hear it at that moment. Or whenever you share the gospel with an unsaved person, you are speaking God's word to them that they hear. You are acting as a prophet to deliver them the good news. Two, prophecy validates the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was greatly helped by one commentator who said the dreams, visions, and prophecies serve to authenticate the presence of the Spirit and to draw the individual into a direct experience with God. And so if we are speaking God's word to people, then we are in a small way prophesying. Listen up. God pours out His Spirit on us abundantly, on all peoples. Listen up. God also performs wonders and signs. The last days began when the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost, accompanying the promise of the Spirit. God will also perform wonders and signs. We read in verses 19 to 20, And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall return to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. These twin words, wonders and signs, appear often throughout the scriptures that occurred in the days of Moses when he, in, during the Exodus. God performed wonders and signs to deliver his people from Pharaoh. Now, how are we to take this? Was this fulfilled on Pentecost, or is this fulfilled at some time in the future? And what are we to do with this? Now, well, the answer is yes, and, and yes in the future, too. It's a double yes, so to speak. In some ways, it began to be fulfilled at Pentecost, and yet even before Pentecost, yet there will also be a future fulfillment of it. These wonders and signs, they point us to Jesus Christ. The twin word, wonders and signs, also occurs a few verses later in verse 22. Note in verse 22 that Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, but with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. Now, you look at these signs and wonders that are here in this passage today, and you look at Jesus' life and you say, well, I don't really recall him calling down fire on anybody. I don't recall him turning, turning the moon to blood, or painting the moon blood. Well, no, he didn't, but he did do other signs and wonders. He opened the eyes of the blind. He opened the ears of the deaf. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. And these were signs and wonders. And it also could refer to the darkening of the sun occurred on the day that he died. The sun was dark as if God blotted out the sun as his own son died. Furthermore, these signs and wonders validate the ministry of the apostles. 
On Pentecost morning, there were tongues of fire that descended on the disciples, yet none of the other wonders and signs described by the prophet Joel were fulfilled. However, throughout the book of Acts, you will see the apostles doing wonders and signs, and signs and wonders, to validate their ministry, to validate the word of God. Acts 14.3, we read of Paul and Barnabas, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Yet even though these signs and wonders point to Jesus and validate the apostles' ministry, they have an ominous feel to them. Blood, fire, vapors of smoke, the sun going dark, the moon turning to blood. That's, that is, threatens destruction, as it were. They provoke thoughts of judgment, not of peace. They're like the dark storm clouds that you see in a distance rising up and coming our way. And then you come inside because you want to take shelter. The blotting out of the sun, the, the staining of the, blue, the moon to blood, it's as if all creation in heaven above and on earth below has been affected by it. It's an unraveling of creation. And these wonders and signs herald the day of the Lord. We note that at the last part of verse 20 that these will happen before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And Jesus himself alluded to, to those verses in Joel during his end times discourse. He said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will shake. And in Revelation 6.12, when the sixth seal is opened, the sun became black as sack sackcloth, the moon became like blood. These wonders and signs herald the day of the Lord. So what do we do with this then? How do we take it? And I think John Calvin uh, sheds some light on the purpose of these wonders and signs. He says, but this serves greatly to the setting forth of grace, that whereas all things do threaten destruction, Yet whosoever does call upon the name of the Lord is sure to be saved. In other words, these signs, these wonders, they threaten destruction. They remind us that life is short. They remind us that one day the world is going to come to an end. And when we look and see wars and hear rumors of wars, when we see riots happening and taking place in the city, when we see uh, an eclipse of the sun, or, or when the, the moon is sometimes red because of the pollution, that is a reminder to us that the day of the Lord is going to come and we will stand before Him and give an account of ourselves to Him. And it reminds us and says to us, are you ready? Are you ready for the day of the Lord to come? Are you right with God? That is the purpose of the signs and the wonders. And so we come to this. Now the last part is uh, that God provides salvation. It leads to the, the, the last point. What do we do with these on, ominous wonders and signs that threaten us? Is there any hope for us when we recall God's judgment? When we think the end is near, what are we going to do about it? Well, verse 21 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Consider the open invitation. Who shall be saved? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who does this include? Well, everyone. We already, we already looked at it's men and women. It's rich. It's poor. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. God will save you. If you are classified as a human, then everyone includes you. It is as if God sent you a personal invitation to every person in the world. We can imagine the invitation reading like this, Dear, and you can include your own name. Dear Sally, dear Sandy, dear John, dear Don, certain destruction is coming your way. However, I have provided a way for you to escape. If you wish to escape it, you must RSVT. RSVP to this invitation. Sign, the Lord God Almighty, the Ancient of Days, the Creator of the Universe. P.S. I'm coming soon. Be ready. 
How do we respond to God's invitation? What is our response? The verse says that we must call upon the name of the Lord. Well, what does this mean? Do we dial his, his number on our cell phone in times of need and then forget about him? Not quite. This phrase, as one commentator explains, implies identifying the Lord as one's own God. This is not a prayer of desperation in moments of crisis, but the consistent identification with the God of Israel. When you call upon God, He is your God. It means to con consistently worship Him alone and worship Him exclusively. This is not a quick text to the Lord when we need a parking spot. This is saying, you are the Lord. You are master. I am your servant. I am yours. You bought me with your blood. I am yours. And that is what it means. When it tells us to call upon the Lord's name, it signifies that God whose character and reputation are known through, as God revealed them through His Word. And if you ever want to know more about God, read His Word. In Peter's sermon, Pentecost sermon, he identifies Lord with Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified, risen, and exalted Lord. This means that if you call on to some God, you are not going to be saved. You oftentimes hear people say, oh, I believe in God. But then, as you get to talk to them and as you get to know them, you find out that the God that they believe in and the God that is in the Bible are two separate things. The Apostle Peter later says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name but the name of Jesus that you must call upon in order to be saved. What is the result if you respond to the invitation? It's that you will be saved. And salvation in the Bible is like a diamond. It has many facets to it. But here it seems that Peter is focusing on the forgiveness of sins. He is focusing on the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Negatively, he will define it as rescue from this crooked generation. Listen up. Pentecost means that God has poured out His Holy Spirit. It means that God is provide, performing signs and wonders and saying, hey, the last days are here. Get ready. And it also means that God has provided salvation. So what do we do with this? One, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit and you can rejoice. And I challenge you to go through the scriptures and find out and learn more about the great gift of the Holy Spirit that He has given you. Two, the signs and wonders. As we look around our world, we need to take it to heart that one day this world is going to come to an end and one day we are going to stand before God. Are you ready for that day? And if you are not, then there's good news. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon His name. Go home, lock yourself in your room, and say, Lord, what do I need to do? And it's very simple. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call out to Him. Say, Lord, I have sinned. But you sent your Son to die for me. I believe in Him. He rose again from the dead. He is in heaven, always interceding on my behalf. Forgive me, and I will follow you, and you will be saved. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, may your word go forth and not return to you void, but may you accomplish the things that you, you have said through your word to your people. And Lord, I pray I pray, Lord, that we will be very aware that our life is oftentimes very short. We are but a mist, we are but a vapor, we are but a breath, and then we are gone. And only those who believe in you will live forever. And I pray, Lord, that we will remember that, that our life is short, but eternity is long. And I pray that we 
who will live lives that are pleasing to you, live lives full of your Holy Spirit, that you will be glorified and praised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.